Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're getting into Tick's Blau video. This is a pretty long video, so I probably won't be stopping it a whole lot, just trying to kind of get through it. Um, but whenever there's something that I want to point out, I'll, I'll point it out. So let's get into it and see what he has to say. Blau is a complete disaster for the Germans, so much so that it brings the German army to the brink and ends the traditional German way of war, the war of movement. On the surface, Blau appears to be a success. Look at the territory that the Germans take, but when you dive into the details, you find that this campaign, the main summer offensive of 1942, ends in failure, having not achieved its objectives. So let's dive into the details and explain the failure that was Case Blue. To fully understand Blau, we first need to look back at Operation Barbarossa. What happens in Barbarossa in 1941 directly dictates what happens in 1942 during Operation Blau. And it really explains both why Blau became a thing in the first place and also why Blau failed. Germany invades the Soviet Union in 1941, and Hitler says that the priority is in the South. He wants to take the food and the minerals in the Ukraine, and he wants to take the oil of the Caucasus. This is because German-occupied Europe is suffering under a food crisis and a massive oil deficit, which is bringing the German economy to a halt and would bring the army to a standstill in October of 1941. So Hitler wants to prioritize the South in order to get the resources that Germany desperately needs to continue the war. But Franz Halder does not want to go South. Freaking Halder, man. Halder is the chief of staff of the German Army High Command, the OKH, and Halder looks at the French campaign in 1940, sees that the reason they won that war was because they'd encircled the enemy forces and then marched to Paris. So yeah, but that... France is one geographic size, and the Soviet Union is you know, 1.2 million times the size of, of France. Like, obviously that's an exaggeration, but France is so much smaller than the Soviet Union that the the idea that the the war would work in the same way is is just like mind numbing. So he takes that to mean that the way to win a war is to encircle the enemy forces, then take the capital. He then applies this logic to the East and wants to wage the same style of war that had won in France, but against the Soviet Union. Encircle the Soviet troops first, then take Moscow and then win. The problem is that the Soviet Union and Russia previously was a completely different animal to France. Even a cursory glance at a map will show you now the distance, well, this is France, and then this is the Soviet Union. Yeah. France versus the Soviet Union, it, it's just, it's a huge difference. Now, the population is not as dense as it was in Western Europe, but the landmass itself and the distances and the space is massively different. So much so that even the operational plan for Barbarossa says, well, German panzers can't drive to the Pacific, and that the ultimate objective is a line from Archangelisk to Astrakhan. This is just a made-up line, yeah. by the way, having no real-world terrain border. The Ural Mountains are even further back from this, so they won't even be affected if the Germans got to this point, which, spoiler, spoiler alert, they don't actually do. And unlike France, the Soviets and the Russians previously knew that their strength lay in the great distances that their state had. You see this in many campaigns, the famous one being Napoleon's conquest of Moscow. Yeah, the whole, the whole thing is, though, this isn't a new idea. Like, maybe it is... 
Obviously, this has happened with Russia before. Again, they just gave the Napoleon example. But Steps tribes have been doing this for millennia. Like, handling powers that far exceeded theirs. Um, just because they have so much space, it's incredibly difficult to, uh, to overthrow the entire uh, area and culture and everything whenever there's just people can just keep going further and further inland right like it's there are a million historical examples of why this campaign would be so different than in the west freaking halder man in 1812 which didn't bring about a collapse of the russian state but there are many more, including World War I, where the Germans occupied vast tracts of Russian territory, and yet the Russian and then Soviet state, well, it's still fighting, although in this case, it was fighting itself. Effectively, this is a completely different game with different rules. What works on the European chessboard does not work on the Asiatic Go board. So taking the Soviet capital and taking vast amounts of territory by itself probably won't bring about the collapse of the Soviet state. And you can see this in Hitler's logic. If he takes the food in the Ukraine and the oil in the Caucasus, the Soviet Union would be deprived of the means to fight. And Yeah, and that's the, that's the whole thing right there, right? Like, I know Hitler is the, you know, history's biggest dick and everybody's, he's very easy to uh, lambast and tear down because of just how much of, of a dick he was. But with the mindset of how to win a war, you know, in the East, he has, he is on the right track. Halder is not, right? Like, that is... He has the right idea of how this could potentially be done. Not just for the future success of Germany, but how to tear down the Soviet Union. Do it through resources. Germany would know, right? Hitler's having to deal with all this on the German side. Having to boost production. You know, they have a Germany has a ton of manpower because they have basically all of continental Europe. But that's kind of a misnomer. Because they have all, like in France specifically, they have all of these instances of people actually purposefully messing things up during, you know, during production, um, which is why the vast majority of production is, is done in Germany throughout the entirety of the war. Um, but he is dealing with these lack of resources and the way that, that it dictates how he can operate. So he sees that viewpoint and, and rightfully, I think, views the East as as being able to kind of switch and Germany be able to take the resources and then put the Soviet Union in the bad spot in the resource department. Germany would have all the resources she needs to continue the struggle. This is uh, very much a strategic mindset, the type of logic needed on a go board. But Halder's logic is... Let's defeat the armies in the field, take Moscow, and then that will somehow result in a victory. This is very much a chess player type of logic. But the reality is taking Moscow won't result in victory and won't deprive the Soviets of the means to keep fighting, unlike the southern route. Yet at the time, prior to the war against the Soviet Union, Halder decides to apply what he learns of the French campaign on the Barbarossa campaign, regardless of what Hitler wants. So, what Halder does is he manipulates Hitler's orders to change the priority from the south, where Hitler wants to go, to the center, Moscow. And he does this without telling Hitler. Army groups north, center, and south are arranged with Halder's logic in mind. Army Group Center takes the priority in terms of units and supplies. Hitler's going to take this very well. And so on. And Army Group South doesn't receive as much as it really should have done. Now, David Stahill, in his book Operation Barbarossa and Germany's Defeat 
in the East goes into this in a lot more detail. And I highly recommend it if you haven't read it already. But basically, Hitler doesn't learn of Halder's manipulation and reorientation of the priority of the campaign until after the campaign is well underway. Halder's plan is to make it easier for German armies to move towards Moscow, so that Hitler will then conclude with Halder that Moscow should become the priority. Um, the problem is that when Hitler realises that's what's happened, it results in a conflict between Halder and Hitler. And this is another good example of why Hitler comes to the conclusion that he shouldn't have listened to his generals, because in this case he was right. Halder had betrayed him and had disobeyed his orders to the detriment of the campaign and the war as a whole. Hitler was absolutely right to prioritise the South, and Halder was dead wrong in prioritising Moscow. This is very interesting, because Halder doesn't get dunked on very much in historians' writings. Like, he is... Tit goes in this, into this in the last video we did, but because he has influence in the post-war writings of the war or portrayal of the war, um, he actually kind of gets portrayed in a much better light than this. But yeah, it's, it's, he's, he's playing checkers and everybody else around him is viewing the chessboard and watching moves very carefully. He doesn't understand because he's not even looking at the chessboard, right? He's looking at his checkers board and saying, this is what we need to do. Hitler is having an aneurysm and saying you're looking at the wrong damn board. And interestingly, Stalin in 1941 correctly guesses that Hitler wanted to attack on the southern front. This is why there are so many units in the Ukraine in 1941 and partly why they were caught off guard when the German attack came because, well, some Soviet units were still redeploying to the south when Barbarossa began. When the German attack goes towards Moscow, the center axis, the Soviets in that area are overwhelmed by the concentration of German forces there. They go two or three months into the campaign and the Germans run out of fuel and then get bogged down in the fighting outside Moscow. Fast forward to 1942 and Stalin concludes, okay, I was wrong about Hitler wanting to go south in 1941, and clearly he's aiming for Moscow. Therefore, we need to prioritise the Moscow area in 1942, because this is where the main German summer offensive will attack. And to take the Germans off guard a little bit, we'll launch a diversionary attack in the south at Kharkov. In fact, Marshal Timoshenko actually proposed this attack in order to divert German attention and reinforcements from the upcoming attack on Moscow. Attempting a pincer movement against the Germans at Kharkov, their attacks are halted and, well, they went almost nowhere. Why? Because they'd gone straight into the teeth of the German forces preparing for the summer offensive in the south. Blau. Hitler once again instructed Halder to make the plan, this time for Fall Blau. And I'm going to emphasize that Halder does the majority of the work for this plan, so many of the faults with this plan are actually Halder's, and we'll come back to them later. But unlike the Barbarossa plan, Hitler and Jodl made alterations, probably to ensure that Hitler's wishes were adhered to this time, and this fact annoys Halder, who later complains about both Hitler and Jodl, even though he was at fault the first time. The objective now was absolutely set in the south, and the remainder of the Ukraine was to be taken, the Caucasus would be captured as well, along with her vital oil fields. After encircling and destroying Soviet forces in the eastern Ukraine, the Germans would move along the Don, and eventually reach Astrakhan. At this point, the plan was to turn south and go into the Caucasus proper, taking Maykop and Grozny. 
These were two major oil producing sites north of the Caucasus Mountains. Now a lot of people say that the Germans were trying to get to Baku, but that doesn't seem to actually be the case. In fact, this is why going to Astrakhan was important. If they take Maykop and Grozny and get them up and running, the Germans would have substantially more oil. And if they take Astrakhan, not only would this prevent Soviet reinforcements from going south, which may actually ultimately help them reach Baku, but they could block oil shipments from the Caucasus going to the rest of the Soviet Union. Blocking the oil would then cripple the Soviet economy completely in 1943, leading to her collapse, and if not, would certainly hinder her mechanized forces. Therefore, Baku wasn't necessary for Blau, and the Astrakhan part of the strategy was to block oil shipments going north along the line. Yeah, I'm of the opinion that if they block, in, in any long-term form, if they block oil going to the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union is going to collapse rather quickly. Um, it's not really a, a... I don't really have a strong opinion of, like, the Germans taking the oil and their ability to get production up, like... A lot of different people have different opinions on that, but I am of the opinion that if they block the oil going north, that the Soviet Union is, is for all intents and purposes, completely done. Volga. This then explains why the decision was later made to go into Stalingrad. And this is important to note. Stalingrad wasn't the ultimate objective of Blau, and in fact, it's barely mentioned in the initial plan. When it is mentioned, it says going into the city isn't a priority. It's not Here's necessary. the Stalingrad quote from the plan. In any event, every effort will be made to reach Stalingrad itself, or at least to bring the city under fire from heavy artillery so that it may no longer be of any use as an industrial or communications center. So that is the, the key, right? Stalingrad itself has no real value in what the Germans are trying to accomplish here. Specifically, you can basically just destroy it or or bombard it and you do really what you want to do. As far as the cutting of the oil, you don't have to take Stalingrad to be able to do that. They didn't have to go into Stalingrad. It wasn't seen as that important. What was more important was the Northern Guard line along the Don and the Volga in order to prevent the Soviets from breaking through, which would disrupt German efforts in the Caucasus. And Blau can be summed up by saying, first we'll break through the Soviet lines, encircle and destroy them, then race off towards Astrakhan, forming the northern flank, and then we'll head into the Caucasus. That, in a nutshell, is Operation Blau. However, there are several problems with the Blau plan. Problem number one is the distances involved. Remember when we said that the Soviet Union and Russia previously had the advantage of vast distances, which was one of the state's natural strengths? Well, Blau would send the Germans another 800 kilometers into Soviet territory. And if we bear in mind that the German armies were already at the limits of their logistical capabilities, this would put further strain on German supply. In fact, in November of 1940, the Army Quartermaster General, Major General Wagner, predicted that German logistics could only take them about 500 to 800 kilometers yep. into the Soviet Union before it broke down. He did in fact tell Halder, who ignored him, and Wagner's predictions turned out to be very accurate. The, the point is that the Germans had already gone this distance in 1940 and had broken down. Now they were planning on going another 800 kilometers in 1942. It's simply madness, uh, utter lunacy. But it seems they had no choice. Problem number two, they didn't have enough troops. 72 German divisions would be allocated to Blau. However, because the Germans were stretched thin across a front extending from the Crimea to Leningrad, which is a front of around 2,700 kilometers at this point, Jeez. 
they couldn't concentrate enough forces in the south to complete their objectives for Blau. Now, a lot of people will say that the Germans had, in, had already lost so many men in 1940 that they couldn't replenish their losses for 1942. This is actually incorrect. The Germans did, in fact, replenish their losses from 1941. Their divisions may not be 100% replenished at the start of the campaign, but the manpower certainly was around. Now, the problem is that they were at the height of their logistical capabilities facing an enemy which knew they were coming and were about to stretch themselves even thinner yeah, and with all of the problems that the Germans are having, let's be honest, the Soviet Union was not known for its, you know, A1 infrastructure. So it's not even like they're having to go great distances, but they're having to go great distances in a, in a totally, you know, different way. By riding off towards Astrakhan and Grozny. At the height of this advance... The front would be a massive 4,100 kilometers long. God. And once they got to Astrakhan, they were then going to guard the northern flank with several armies, while they also went south into the Caucasus. This, in itself, was a major problem. German military cannon, up to this point, said that one army group could take one strategic axis. This way forces would be concentrated and thrust towards one objective, which would give them several operational and tactical advantages. The problem with Blau is that they were going for three objectives. Voronezh, Astrakhan, and then the Caucasus. Now, technically, they don't advance on all three at the same time, but Army Group South would be torn between those three objectives, no matter which order they actually do them in, or if they do them all, or if they do them all at the same time, or whatnot. Therefore, even before Bar was on the way, the plan required at least two, if not three, full army groups. And the Germans didn't have the forces to create two or three full army groups in the south. They had one. And as we know from what happened in Operation Barbarossa, this army group, Army Group South, didn't even have priority in terms of number of units, so they had to make them the priority in 1942. Even though they had 72 German divisions for Blau, this simply wasn't going to be enough for this campaign, and they couldn't really spare more from the other two army groups. There was a siege going on at Leningrad in Army Group North's zone, and massive battles at Rezhev going on in Army Group Center's area of operations. The Soviets are constantly counter-attacking at Rezhev because they don't want the Germans to get to Moscow. So, unable to pull more German divisions to the south, the Germans needed help. In addition to the 72 German divisions allocated to Blau, 22 divisions would be Hungarian, Italian, and Romanian. Plus, more of these Axis Allied forces would arrive as the campaign progressed. For Blau, the Germans had 1 million soldiers, plus 300,000 Axis Allied troops. And to ensure that these forces could operate over two, if not three, strategic Axis, Army Group South would be split into two army groups. These would be Army Group A, which would go riding off into the Caucasus, and Army Group B, which would guard the northern Don Volga flank. In terms of strength, this split of Army Group South was a fiction. These were not full army groups. In fact, by August, Army Group A in the Caucasus would have just two armies while Army Group B had six, three of which were non-German armies. So at a time when they needed two, if not three, full army groups, the Germans had two half army groups, and they weren't entirely German army groups either. And of the 72 German divisions allocated to Blau, only nine were armoured and five were motorised. The rest were basically infantry or similar. Which, this is the way that, like, if you're going to make these huge strides, if you're going to cover these long distances, that's the way you need to do it. Like, if you're doing it with essentially all infantry, then then the whole plan is 
almost like fictitious. Like it's almost like a, a just a plan in theory. But but to ask infantry to cover that amount of distance is bizarre. This would have a massive impact on what was clearly not a flawless plan, especially when you consider problem number three, the Red Army. This was no longer the first 14 days of Operation Barbarossa when Halder had announced that the war was won. <clears throat> the Red Army had survived 1941 and was busy making its recovery. In 1942, the factories that had been packed up and shipped off to the Urals were now rebuilt and coming back online. The troops in the field were beginning to get more than just rifles and outdated tanks. Unlike the previous year, when most of the Soviet tanks had been light or bad tanks, roughly a quarter of the tanks were now T-34s. The Red Army was in the midst of a major reorganization and reconstruction program designed to enable it to engage Wehrmacht forces successfully in both the summer and the winter. And it would do so. The Red Army would put up a strong resistance to the German summer offensive, which would hinder the German advance and stretch the German army to breaking point. But the German commanders weren't stupid. They actually expected the Soviets to put up a fight, unlike what they'd done the previous year when Barbarossa had achieved complete strategic surprise. Now, in 1942, without strategic surprise, the Germans expected the initial period of Blau to be more of a static battle and had planned accordingly. But when the great second German summer offensive begins on the 28th of June 1942, this turned out to not be the case. Beating the Soviet forces immediately ahead of them, the German 2nd Army and 4th Panzer Army race off towards their objective, Foreign Edge. By the 4th of July, Hoth's 4th Panzer Army had reached the Don in several places. On its left, 2nd Army came up as well, and 6th Army to the south only began to move on the 30th of June, but also broke through the Soviet units with ease. Take note though. This position that Paulus's army had broken through with ease was a position that the Soviets had been constructing for around about six months. And Paulus had broken through it without breaking a sweat. And now columns of Soviet forces were just fleeing to the east. Almost as quickly, 6th Army and 4th Panzer Armies trapped the Soviet 40th Army on the 2nd of July, which was then devoured over the course of the, of the next few days. Up to this point, things had gone relatively well, although the Germans were now surprised how quickly Soviet resistance had subsided. The Soviets had lost control and command of many of their subunits, and the outlook for the Soviets on a whole did not look good. With this, the second phase of Blau began, or sort of. See, Von Bock's forces at Voronezh were being counterattacked by a Soviet tank force. So Von Bock was reluctant to send 4th Panzer Army south, as was part of the original Blau plan. Hitler became enraged, later going on to complain of how his Panzer force had wasted 48 hours sat at Voronezh, thanks to von Bock. And this is an issue, especially when you consider that the Germans only had nine armoured and five motorised divisions for this campaign, and that three armoured and two motorised of these divisions were now tied up at the city of Voronezh. At stake here, though, is a much bigger picture than just a simple little argument. The traditional German way of war said that an army commander could make his own decisions and act on his own initiative. If von Bock wanted 4th Panzer Army for a couple of extra days, then he was entitled to it, right? No, the objective is to take the oil fields in the Caucasus, not fight a tactical battle at Voronezh, and von Bock is preventing that from happening. This is my point about why 
the motorized, the, the mechanized and tank units are so important if you're going to make a, a huge push and cover that amount of distance in something like this because you saw how quickly they broke through the 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 tank division the, the panzer division broke through and got to Voronezh right like that is that's the way the Germans like to do warfare right they like that that quick movement they like the the hit and surprise and keep moving they love to do that um, but they just they have so few of them that you know, even just tying down a handful for a couple more days becomes a massive ordeal. Hitler, who has not been schooled in the traditional German Junker officer way of war, does not care about the tactical situation at Voronezh. He has a strategic mindset, unlike von Bock, and he wants 4th Panzer Army to go south. On the 2nd and 3rd of July, Hitler and Bock meet to discuss the situation and Bock conceded to the pressure from above to release 4th Panzer Army. You hear often how Hitler should have listened to his generals. Well, on the strategic level, his generals were squandering what little time they had to win the war. Another crack in the traditional German way of war. On the 6th of July, Voronezh... It totally depends on when in the war and where in the war you're talking about. On, you know, the decision making between the generals and Hitler. In this case, yeah, the, the, the generals on the ground just don't seem to have a grasp of the, the big strategic picture. Fell, but on the 8th of July, von Bock sent a message to Halder, and his outlook for the campaign was not good. Bock said that the German pincers would probably close around nothing, and that, in my opinion, Operation Blau 2 is dead. To explain this, basically, Fall Blau was designed as a series of operations rather than just one plan. It was more of a set-piece battle with timings and various thrusts, which was more like a British battle plan rather than a traditional German, okay, go figure it all out as it goes, plan. The reason it was planned like this was for two reasons. The first was because the traditional German way of war had failed in Barbarossa. Having your generals ride off into the sunrise on their own initiative is great, but only if you don't leave millions of enemy troops on your flanks or rear. <coughs> Guderian. So <laughs> instead of racing off to create massive encirclements, which they couldn't keep a tight ring around, allowing the Red Army to simply walk out of the trap, the Panzer forces now had to create little encirclements so the infantry could do their work. This meant that the generals really couldn't have operational freedom like they'd had before. The two styles simply don't complement each other, and so they were reined in to fight a more classic style of battle rather than a war of movement. The second reason was because they expected the Soviets to fight harder than they'd done the year before, since they no longer had the strategic surprise. The Soviets knew they were at war, and knew that the enemy ahead of them could attack them. So they were better prepared than they had been the year before. They'd also been digging defences for several months now and seemed to be better prepared. Also worth noting is that the year before, during Barbarossa, the Soviets had struck back into the jaws of the German pincers. <laughs> Uh, they'd effectively counterattack themselves straight into the prisoner of war camps. But well, that was in 1941. In 1942, during Case Blue, something else was happening. Now, what I'm about to describe is, is still up for debate, but I want to provide some clarity to it and not just make some sweeping remarks that others have made. So please bear in mind that the picture is not clear. I'm interested where he's going with this. On the 7th of July, Timoshenko ordered a general retreat to prevent his forces from getting encircled by the German pincers. So, on the operational level at least, the Soviets ordered a purposeful 
retreat. But even as early as the 30th of June 1942, Soviet forces from mostly divisional level downwards were already retreating. And this retreat at divisional level downwards was not the calm, collected retreat of an organized army. No, the Soviets lost command and control of their units. There was large-scale desertions and the loss of much equipment. It was a rout. As Satino points out in his book, Death of the Wehrmacht, the Soviet troops weren't stupid. <laughs> they knew that, especially in the summer, the German panzer attacks would encircle and destroy them, and they had no intention of becoming prisoners of war. So they just began to flee. On the one hand, then, we have a purposeful retreat. On the other hand, a rout. And while many argue it was one or the other, the reality is it was probably both. It just depends on what level of the command structure you're talking about. I yeah, the see, this is a very interesting point. And I get a lot that, you know, we take the Soviets from later in the war, um, and even what they became way down the road, um, you know, way into the Cold War. And I feel like that historical viewpoint of knowing where eventually they get to starts to color the way we look at them during other parts of, of history. And I have heard a lot that there essentially was, you know, that because the Soviets would have uh, put too many men in this area or that area or the third, um, at the beginning of the war, if like in the South, right, there's all these troops in the South, that's why there's these huge movements in the center. Um, I agree on a, on a base level with that, but part of me like sees the way that the Soviets and the Soviet military acts and reacts in the Winter War, at the beginning of Barbarossa, even right here for, for Blau. And it's like it really takes them a long time to get the, the military revved up into any sort of truly, truly formidable force. And so the idea that they were going to stand and hold for a super concentrated German effort somewhere, I'm not sure if I, I totally buy that. Now, I'm not sure that I don't, but I'm, I'm on the fence about it. And this is exactly why. Because even knowing that the Germans are coming, even having the time to prepare here, there still is just a, a quick backing away of the German army knowing, you know, what's coming around the corner. Either way, though, this retreat or rout would have dire consequences for the plan for Blue. And the German chances of success during the summer offensive were also impacted by this. This is because if the Soviets retreat, then the German pincers won't encircle them. If they don't encircle them, then the Soviets will live to fight another day. They will effectively slip the noose. This is bad because the traditional German way of war said they had to destroy the enemy forces before riding off to victory. And in this case, the Soviets were retreating. So Hitler reacts quickly, launching Blau II on the 9th of July. This was actually a full two weeks earlier than planned. Such is the desperation to keep Blau alive. Army Group South is now split into two, Lists Army Group A and Von Bock's Army Group B. And Kleist's 1st Panzer Army is let loose across the Donetsk River. What happened over the course of the next few days, in any other context but war, could be described as a comedy. Kleist is ordered to go... That's messed up. ...left, then right, then over here, then over there, then over there. And it was a very frustrating time to Kleist, whose army finally met at Milerovo with 6th Army and 4th Panzer Army. The bag of Soviet prisoners they took was just 40,000. That was practically nothing. In fact, in the previous two weeks, the Germans had only taken 100,000 Soviet prisoners of war. This was tiny compared to what they'd hoped to have taken. 
You see, because of the desperation in trying to salvage something from the Blau plan, the mobile elements had gone ahead to try and encircle the fleeing Soviet soldiers. And they had to do this rapidly, otherwise the Soviets would slip their grasp. So the panzers had actually shot off ahead of the infantry, much like the year before. And the infantry simply couldn't keep up with them. Most of the Soviet troops they had encircled had actually been driving alongside the German panzer columns, or had dispersed before them, or hadn't actually been encircled because the German infantry couldn't keep up. It was a repeat of the same problems that had happened during Operation Barbarossa. The chess game does not work on a go board. It had all gone wrong and a scapegoat was found. Von Bock was sacked on the 17th of July and replaced by Vikes. The charge against Bock was that he'd tied up the panzer forces of Voronezh for too long, although Vikes had also wanted the panzers for Voronezh too. So anyway, the Blau plan was in tatters and the Soviets were now responding. In the wake of the German attack and for his failings here and in the previous year, Timoshenko was dismissed. And in his place, the Stavka created two new fronts. The first was the Voronezh front on the 7th of July, which would be commanded by Fedutin on the 14th of July. And the Stalingrad front created on the 12th of July. This would be commanded by Gordov from the 21st of July. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and break this into two different videos so that each one isn't, or so so that I don't have one like two hour video since I talked more than I thought I was going to. But the second one will be out almost right after this one. So, but I'm just breaking it up so it's easier to digest. Um, so I'll get to the next one and get it put out very quickly and I'll see you guys then.